Hello, my name is Thomas Graf. I hope everybody had a good lunch. I'm still pretty full. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about Cilium BPF. It will be a somewhat Kubernetes specific. So before I start, I would like to understand who has no clue at all about BPF, has never heard of BPF at all. Who is kind of knows what BPF is, but is not quite the super expert yet, mid-level. And who is like the pro? All right, well, I want to talk about, oh, yeah, I know you. Otherwise, I would have proposed, well, let's, talk, let's talk hiring right away. Um, all right, so Cilium, what is Cilium? Um, I try to put it in one sentence, API-aware networking security using BPF and XDP. We're going to dive a little, little bit into what that, what that means. Um, I think the other part that summarizes it well is that picture up there which is kind of has the Kubernetes container ship up there, and then the anchor is IP tables, and then Cilium with BPF is coming along and it's kind of cutting down that, that, uh, that anchor. Um, so we're using BPF as a replacement for a lot of uh, values that have previously been provided by use of IP tables. And I'm, I, can, I can blame, I can, I can talk bad about IP tables because I helped write it, so I'm one of the few people that can actually uh, really bash it. All right. So what is BPF? BPF, this is what the tool chain looks like, and some of you may have seen this. Um, so what BPF gives us is the ability to lo load small programs into the Linux kernel and run them when a particular event is happening. For example, when a system call is being made, or when a network packet is being received or, or, or is being sent, or when an application is enqueuing data into a socket, or when a user space application is calling a particular function for which we know the symbol address of, and so on. So for example, we can run a small program whenever a TCP retransmission is happening, or we can call a program whenever a connect system call is happening, or we can call a program whenever a particular network packet is received on a virtual interface that is owned by a particular container. So BPF gives us the ability to extend the kernel with, with, with uh, logic, with small programs. These small programs can be written by a programmer in source code. Typically, this is done using pseudo C, so a, rest a restricted C code subset. We could then feed that into a compiler tool chain, in this case, LLVM, which basically takes the, the, the pseudo C code and emits BPF bytecode, which is an instruction set that's close to x86 assembly, um, a program. We can then load that program into the kernel and say, run this program whenever the system call is being made, run this program whenever a network packet is being received. Like most of you have actually used BPF in some form. For example, if you're using Chrome, Chrome will leverage BPF to isolate and limit the system calls that a Chrome plugin can do. Or if you have been using TCP dump, TCP dump leverages BPF to filter the actual packets that are being displayed. So if you do TCP dump and you say port 80 only, that's a small PPF program which will run for every packet received and all that program is does, it will say, look at the destination port, if it's 80, return one and we will actually display that. So we've all been using BPF in some way. Um, what, like what we're talking about here is this extended eBPF or, or extended BPF, eBPF, which became a lot more powerful. So what happens when we, when we load this into the kernel and isn't that kind of dangerous to load an arbitrary program into the kernel and load it? Isn't that just a kernel module? So there's one big difference between a kernel module and BPF, and it's, it's the verifier bit. Oh, this doesn't actually work. It's the verifier bit up there. So when we load the program, the kernel doesn't just accept it and run it. It will, very, it will verify the program first. For example, it will make sure that there is no loops inside the program. So the program has to long, run to completion. It will, for example, prevent us from arbitrarily uh, leaking kernel memory. We can also not just call into arbitrary kernel functions. There's, a, there's a, a whitelisted set of functions that we can talk to or we can call. So there's a known APIs. We can't just like, arbitrarily access kernel memory or kernel functions. And then the last bit is the just-in-time compiler. So BPF itself, as we load it into the kernel, is a software bytecode instruction set. With the just-in-time compiler, we'll take that program and we compile it to x86, ARM, PPC, whatever, whatever your CPU actually runs, which means that from an efficiency perspective, we're back to native execution, native compilation execution. So to summarize it, 
we can basically extend the kernel at the speed as if we would have recompiled the kernel, and we can run logic small programs at arbitrary events inside of the Linux kernel. There's a typo in this slide. Uh, kudos to those who have noticed it. Uh, I was just too lazy to, to fix it up. It's the, there's TC ingress is mentioned twice for those that, that noticed. All right, so rise of BPF and XDP. I've listed four use cases here that I'm diving into a little bit. Um, I think some of you may have known about, I've heard about Facebook's use of BPF. I heard it in an earlier talk in the morning as well. I think BPF is being leveraged a lot in terms of profiling, visibility, uh, and now also networking and security. So Cilin will be more on the networking and the security side, but I wanted to make sure I also mention some of the other use cases. So the first, the, the, the one, the upper left, the lower left, and the upper right are basically all tracing and visibility. Like, many of you may have heard Brendan Gregg talk about uh, flame graphs and using BPF to actually trace applications and figure out what function call is actually consuming CPU. And he's able to do this with BP, BPF at low overhead. So he's gaining the, 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 um, the ability to actually profile applications while they run at, at, the, at, the, at the minimal overhead. The last example is the one in the lower right, which is that the kernel community about two or, two or three months ago has decided that the data path portion, the kernel piece of IP tables, is being replaced by BPF. Because BPF is being, def is, is being declared the future in terms of how these things should be done in the future, and it doesn't really make sense to maintain both an, like a, an IP tables version of the data path and the BPF data path. So while preserving the, 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 the IP tables binary compatibility, so while allowing you to continue using IP tables as a binary, the kernel portion is being replaced with a BPF implementation. So I'm diving into this a little bit. This slide was actually, this was not open source when I first present, uh, and presented this. Facebook, I think, at NetConf at 16 maybe, uh, presented this, this slide with, with, and basically announced to the world that, hey, we're, we're starting to use BPF XDP for our load balancing needs. And they put this loud, uh, slide out, and it's showing kind of the performance difference between IPVS, which is another Linux-based load balancing solution, um, with BPF and XDP, and then nobody really truly believed those numbers. Like, those numbers are way too good. Like, how, how is that possible? How can we replace a piece of software with another piece of software, and there's like a 10x performance difference? Um, but it turns out that this is actually true, and it's, it's not because the software is better, it's simply because it's running a lot closer to the, to the network driver, which is why, which is why this, the, the, the slash XDP is in there. So this is the ability to run a BPF program basically inside of Linux network driver, so extremely close to the network hardware with access to the DMA buffer. So we actually we can cut off a huge portion of the kernel code that would otherwise introduce latency. But it's showing um, the, the kind of the true nature and p potential of BPF as a, as a, a really interesting uh, technology. The code has since been released, so you can go uh, to get up to Facebook's incubator. Uh, it's called Catron, Catron, um, Catron I'm assuming. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, Dtrace, or Dtrace for Linux. Um, Dtrace was huge on Solaris, right? And Linux never really had an equivalent uh, tool. So like BPF or BCC or... Um, as various other kind of frameworks that do more or less the same. It's a use of BPF for profiling and tracing uh, purposes. Uh, Netflix is very, uh, has lots of blog, blog posts around this. Then <laughs> IP tables. So this, I really like this, this tweet by uh, Jerome. In any team, you need a tank, a healer, a damage dealer, somebody with crowd control abilities and another who knows IP tables. I think a lot of us in the networking field in particular have been in a situation where I try to um, like debug a system with 10,000 IP tables and it turns out to be extremely difficult. So with, with the, I think with the um, introduction of Cilium, we're trying to, to, to resolve this to a large extent by actually not re relying on huge sets of rules, but actual good logic. We'll talk, about more about, we'll talk more about that. Uh, that's what I referred to earlier, which is kind of the BPF um, being replacing uh, IP tables. Uh, there's a QR code up there with a blog post, and also there's an, an AWN article, which gives some of the, the background of this. All right, and I usually don't do performance number slides, but this one is, is, is actually interesting because I think it shows um, why it's, it's not just more of the same, but actually something that is entirely different. So this is measuring a relatively simple uh, packet drop implemented using IP tables, NF tables, and then BPF. 
The yellow one is the standard IP tables rule, which basically is, is dropping packets that are matching a particular pattern. The dark blue is uh, using, doing the same using NF tables. NF tables uh, is the successor of IP tables and actually is pretty close to BPF in terms of extensibility. It's also a bytecode virtual machine that you can program. The difference between BPF and NF tables is that BPF is general purpose. You can use it for non-networking, and NF tables is entirely domain specific to networking. So the language actually knows about IP addresses, and it knows about networking, and knows about packets, and so on. BPF is, is, is like Java. It's a general purpose virtual machine. Gray is, is, is BPF. And so it's not the concept of programmability that makes the big uh, performance difference here. It's the where we can attach and run these programs. That's kind of the revolution that's going on here. We can program the kernel at various points. In this case, very close to the network hardware. And because BPF is general purpose, we can even offload that, in this case, onto smart NICs, in which case we actually see another performance win. What's interesting to me as a pure software developer is that we can actually gain huge performance numbers just with software only, without even depending on any hardware-specific features. There are many, many, many more examples, of course. Um, I listed them here. Uh, the Kinfolk folks actually did uh, an amazing Reefscope plugin using BPF, which I, which I can highly recommend running. Also, GoBPF, uh, which gives, gives Golang bindings for BCC. All right, so um, what does eBPF mean in the context of, of uh, Cilium? We're looking at, we'll look at uh, kind of uh, two different use cases. The first one is um, how Cilium provides this in the context of Kubernetes or similar orchestration systems. So Cilium itself is actually a Golang-based agent that will run on your worker nodes, could be Kubernetes, Docker, Mesos, whatever, and takes high-level intent, for example, a CNI plugin request, hey, provide networking for this pod, or hey, implement this security policy, and so on. Or hey, lo do local linting for this particular service IP. And it takes that, that, that notification, and it will generate a BPF program, then, then implements this. So think of Cilium as what takes the BPF complexity away for you, and basically writes the program um, on behalf of you. So instead of manually programming, be, uh, Cilium automatically generates the program. We will actually generate unique programs for particular containers. So instead of having like one program that will then um, be executed and run on behalf of all containers, we look at the particular needs of a container and generate a program for that particular container or pod, which means that we can actually leave out certain uh, implementation details of the program. For example, if a container does not need IPv6, we'll leave that code out. If a container does not need policy, we'll leave that code out. If a, a container does not need load balancing, we'll leave it out. This allows us to basically minimize the code to the minimal amount required to implement the functionality. Um, this is a very basic picture for who knows about Kubernetes and who has never heard about Kubernetes at all. I think they talked before it was about Kubernetes as well, but I'm not sure who is actually familiar with Kubernetes. About half. So CNI is what, what, what Kubernetes uses to basically make networking modular. So whenever a container or a pod is started, CNI will be invoked and will, will request a plugin to provide networking. What Cilium will, will do in this case, it will basically generate the BPF program and, it, and uh, attach it to that pod. So whenever that pod is sending or receiving network traffic, the BPF program will be in the way, and then Cilium or the BPF program will make sure that all the pods can talk to each other. We have two ways of doing this. So uh, we have a mode where we run as a so-called encapsulation mode. This is for those um, familiar with other plugins. This is uh, similar to, for example, Flannel, where we use VXLAN or uh, Geneve. Um, the benefit here is that there is no dependency on how the network underneath operates. As long as nodes have IP connectivity and UDP connectivity, this will kind of just work. The second mode is kind of the direct routing mode, where you have the ability to make your network your network fabric aware of pod IPs or container IPs. This could be achieved by using routing daemons or by running something like kubeRouter. We kind of support both modes. It's up to you uh, what you would like to run here. Often people start out with mode one because it's simpler. As deployments get bigger, they will go into direct routing mode because it has some performance benefits. We also support B uh, BPF-based service load balancing. Um, so typically, the, the, the standard solution is, what is on, on the right, which is called QProxy, um, which by now has a non-IP tables mode as well, using IPVS. 
Um, I'm, this is a slightly older slide, which is still uh, focusing on the IP tables approach. So IP tables basically is a linear list of rules that needs to be traversed every time uh, a load balancing is happening. And once the load balancing decision is done, the decision is cached in the connection tracking table. But that first lookup is actually incredibly slow, and it will get slower the more services that you add, because it's adding more and more and more and more uh, rules to the, to the list. And that's simply because IP tables is 20 years old. So it, at that point, scale did not really matter that much. Just like IPVS, we're using a hash table based mechanism in BPF, which gives kind of linear um, performance in terms of search. Um, this is a summary of the networking features. So we have native IPv6 support. We actually wrote IPv6 first and then added IPv6, IPv4 later. We have a very simple set layer three only mode. I think that's becoming pretty standard in a container world. Um, there's no concept of networks or subnets. It's basically one big flat L3 network, and every pod can potentially talk to each other. Then you can lock it down with security rules. So you don't need to think about how do I manage my addressing space. You can just basically start small, grow big, and it will, it will continue working. We have a tiny, small ARP responder that will allow to resolve the MAC address of the default gateway, but that's it. Other than that, it's all L, it's all L3. We do efficient load balancing. As we saw on the previous slide, we have um, NAT4.6 support, which is the ability to translate between IPv4 and IPv6, which is actually pretty fancy. Uh, it allows you to run an IPv6-only cluster, but then still reach out to IPv4 nodes. Uh, you can make your IPv6-only containers approachable by IPv4, which, uh, which I think is pretty cool. We have a couple of forward-looking users already using this, but I think this is actually going to be the future that no, people don't want to manage IPv4 address space in large clusters. I think they will want to have native IPv6 support. Then we have a connection tracking that is optimized for container workloads. So this general purpose Linux connection tracking is actually built for middle boxes. So it kind of, it can do everything. In the world of containers, there's actually, we can do a lot of assumptions, which we have done in this case. Let's check on time, all right. So that's kind of the networking side of things. So that's a, that's a CNI world that gives you this connectivity between parts. Uh, it's not that super fancy. I think some people are using us because we're a little bit faster, we're a little bit more um, um, efficient. Some people just hate IP tables and they will come to BPF because of that. But where it's actually getting really fancy and interesting is on the network security side. I'm specifically mentioning networking here because we're not doing image scanning, we're not doing system call filtering, we're doing segmentation on the network security side. For this, I would like to bring up one example. Um, and it's probably not a good idea for a kernel developer talking about uh, microservices, but I'm, I'm trying. So this is a basic example where we have a, a service that is exposing an API. Call it the Jobs API. Um, has three simple API endpoints. First of all, we can get uh, jobs. We can post an applicant. So if an applicant has applied to the job, we can post that and add it. We can also get the applicant's data for a particular uh, job. Then we have two different front ends in front of that. One front end is kind of the applicant front end, so that will be the front end that is ex ex exposed outside, and whoever is applying for jobs would um, uh, access uh, or use this front end, and the front end will then call post applicants if an, if an applicant has actually sent in uh, her CV, for example. The second front end is the recruiter front end. The recruiter front end obviously needs to retrieve the applicant's data as well. This is a good example of like a single API that's being consumed by multiple services with multiple levels of sensitive data, right? For example, if the applicant's front end is compromised, like retrieving all applicants is obviously like a, a worst case scenario that we want to avoid at all cost. If you look at the traditional network security world and how a firewall would have, have enabled this or uh, kind of solved security here is we would have done something like allow applicant front end to talk to the jobs API. And whether that's label based, IP based, doesn't really matter like this. On a pure networking front, that's what we would have done. And we would have, could have locked it down on port port 443, for, for, for example, and so on. While this obviously allows the communication to happen, if applicants get comp gets compromised, it could obviously call out and do the get applicants API call and retrieve that information. And that's definitely not least privilege in the sense of API awareness or in the, in the age of microservices. So what we really want is we want something like this. And this is what Cilium provides and what we call API-aware 
security, we can actually look into the API calls that are being made between services. And right now we're supporting HTTP, gRPC, Kafka, which is adding uh, added Cassandra, Memcached, um, and we're going to talk about uh, our new fancy Golang-based extension framework for Envoy at the next KubeCon, uh, which makes it possible to add more and more protocols very, very rapidly. So what we really want is to write a security rule like this. So allow get to slash jobs or post to slash applicants from application or applicant front end. Right? Like, this is the level of network security that we need in the age of microservices, and this is what basically Cilium adds um, that is unique in, that, in this front. Uh, this is showing you the different enforcement points uh, where we can actually enforce security rules. So in this case, you have two containers or two parts. We can obviously do kind of security in between the parts. That's standard stuff, right? So pod or service applicant can talk to uh, jobs API, and we can restrict it down to certain API calls. We can also enforce communication into the cluster. For example, we can say uh, my, front, my poo, uh, pod, pod foo can only be accessed by a certain subnet range, for example. Uh, that's typical if, you, for example, certain services are only exposed to a VPN, then you want to limit it down to the IP range of that VPN. We can also do security outside of the cluster. For example, if, if you're talking to an API that's hosted outside of your cluster. In this case, we actually support DNS-based policies. So instead of whitelisting IP addresses, you can actually uh, embed the DNS name into the policies, and we will automatically resolve it uh, and update the policies as the IPs change for that DNS name. The last bit about security is that we are identity-based. So I think that's another big move, which is instead of kind of traditionally translating uh, policy rules into IP addresses and then enforcing IP addresses talking to each other, what we're doing instead is we're actually looking at all replicas of a particular part, and we are assigning a security identity to that, to that part. And we're doing that for every single pod that's in a Kubernetes cluster or in every container in a Docker Swarm cluster. And then instead of filtering on IP addresses, we embed this identity into all packets that are leaving a particular pod so we can enforce the identity when, when the receiving pod is receiving the packet. So this is very similar to mutual TLS or TLS-based enforcement. The main difference is that we can do this on a packet level, which means it also works for UDP, it also works for ICMP, it works for all network traffic. Mutual TLS or HTTP-based uh, identity mechanisms usually only work for, uh, for, for example, TCP. All right, before we go into the service mesh integration, I want to do a quick demo uh, to, to actually show this. So, all right, so I have a small Kubernetes cluster here. You can see it's starboard space. Let's, let's just make sure I have Wi-Fi connectivity. Maybe not, yeah. All right, so it's closer. Then we'll be a bit slow. I think the internet connection is a bit slow. So let's do the intro. All right, so a long time ago in a container cluster far, far away, it's a period of civil war. The empire has adopted microservices and continuous delivery. Despite this, rebel spaceships striking from a hidden cluster have won their first victory against the evil galactic empire. During the battle, rebel spies managed to steal the Swagger API specification to the Empire's ultimate weapon, the Death Star. Right, so that's the intro to our demo. What I have here, I have basically, I have a couple of deployments that will get started. So let's deploy that. So K is just my alias for cube control. You're not supposed to say cube kettle anymore. So let's see if that's coming up. Um, so I have basically, I have Death Star, I have three replicas of Death Stars, I have a couple of spaceships which are, represent the Empire, and I have a couple of X-Wings which are, are the Rebels. Let's see if everything is up. Okay. So the next thing, I have a small script that will, ex will basically extract me a cube control exact command line, so I'm just gonna copy paste that and run it. So what this will do is we'll actually execute curl inside one of the X-Wing Parts and it will talk to the Death Star service. So let's do that. So this is basically the rebels spying out the Death Star. So let's see what the Death Star responds here. The response is some JSON, like, hey, I'm the Death Star. Um, I have some attributes. And by the way, this is my entire API that I, uh, that I surface. 
Uh, you can do get the slash v1, you can retrieve my health, this would be the Kubernetes health check. You can request a landing, which is probably useful. You can put something into the cargo bay, you can get the status of the hypermatter reactor, or you can put something into the exhaust part. That's, that's, that's pretty interesting. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's do that. Before the rebels come back, though, they actually, the empire actually starts thinking like, shouldn't we protect the Death Star a bit? Um, so they will enforce a so-called layer seven policy. Let's look at that. So this is, this is just standard Kubernetes YAML. It's a CRD custom resource definition in this case. Um, and it says here that this is the policy that will apply to all parts of label Death Star. Um, in the organization Empire. It says this is an ingress rule this, uh, for traffic going into the Death Star, and any part of the label spaceship can talk to me on port 80, and by the way, you can do a get to slash v1, or you can request a landing. So that's kind of the public API endpoints that I want to allow. So let's load that policy. All right, so it's loaded now. So the rebels come back. First of all, I do a get to slash v1. That still works. So now I, let's see if I can turn this into a put. So, up, 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 exhaust port. Access denied. Rebels have lost. You can see it here. Oh, so, but no, I'm sorry, I got changed. I changed the story. Well, no, 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 we didn't, we didn't. So what you notice is that while the, the, while the, the Empire ha has started constructing the Death Star, uh, the rebels, the Jedi have actually managed to infiltrate this. So they managed to basically load a different policy to that the one we saw. So this is the policy that I showed you, and this is the policy that they actually loaded. So let's look at the difference. You can see there's one additional rule in there, which is you can actually do a put to slash exhaust port, but only if you have the HTTP header has force set. So let's try that. So I'm gonna need to add a dash A X has force true. Bang, Death Star exploded, we're good again. So. That was a demo, and I think I'm running out of time anyway, so I think we have maybe one or two minutes for questions, or is it completely, isn't it supposed to be half an hour? Okay, okay. maybe one question, all right. Otherwise, I will be back in the hallway. Before I forget, I have stickers, the, the logo that you saw in the beginning, the spe our special IP tables edition, uh, come up to me and I'm glad to hand you over stickers. Yeah, one, one question. So uh, we've been doing a lot of research into Istio and, and yeah. everything lately, and this seems to have a ton of overlap to Istio. How can you address A, that, B, Istio uh, out of the box allows for best practices for microservices. Can you integrate things like exponential back off and circuit breakers in this as well? Um, would this be instead of Istio? No, so I'll give you a super quick answer because the, that would be in the next topic we would have dived into. Uh, I can give you the link to a presentation at last KubeCon that talks exactly about this. The 30 second summary is this. Silum does not compete at all with Istio. We actually have an Istio integration where we, where we um, allow, for example, you can run Istio and have pilot managed Envoy and we enforce the same rules that you saw here in the sidecar. We can also um, accelerate Istio have numbers and slides. So like the short answer is we're, there's no way we should compete with Istio, we're not. Like we're actually the best match. So if you want to run Istio, you should talk to us about running Cilium underneath. Cool, All right, we're running out of time. Thanks a lot, I'm outside if you have more questions.